Greetings, greetings, greetings. Good afternoon, everybody. I am your host, Shana Terrell, and welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline. I am an educator activist dedicated to the lifelong struggle of freedom and liberation for her people. I want to shout out all my co-conspirators watching out there. We appreciate your support. We appreciate you watching week after week. And shout out to my new folks out there joining us this week. I am pretty sure we have some folks out there from the West Side, West Coast, joining us today um, for this viewing. And we want to thank everybody who continues to, to support our We Need Black Teachers campaign. Um, thank you for those of you. We see you. We appreciate all the help you've been giving us. If you would like to know more about our campaign, please visit WeNeedBlackTeachers.org um, and buy yourself some merch while you are there. And as always, shout out to Citizens Ed and the Center for Black Educated Development for giving us, giving us this platform to talk to real people doing the real work and the real struggle. So this week, y'all, we'll be talking about building a Black Educator Pipeline through revolutionary activism. And today we're going to explore some topics about serving leadership, humanity, and education and power to the people. My guest today a woman, a leader, a Black Panther will be talking to me and our CEO, Sharif el Meki about revolution, education, and youth activism. So my guest today is Erica Huggins. She is an educator, leading Black Panther party member, former political prisoner, human rights activist, and a poet. For more than 50 years, Erica has used her life experiences in service to community. From 1973 to 1981, she was director of the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. From 1990 to 2004, Erica managed HIV and AIDS volunteer education programs. She also supported innovative mindfulness programs for women and youth in schools, jails, and prisons. Erica was professor of sociology and African-American studies from 2008 to 2015 in a Par Paralata Community College District. From 2003 to 2011, she was professor of women and gender studies at California State University's East Bay in San Francisco. Erica is racially, Erica is a racially equity learning lab facilitator for World Trust Educational Services. She curates conversations focused on the individual and collective work of becoming equitable in all areas of our daily lives. Additionally, she facilitates workshops on the benefit of spiritual practices and sustaining social change. So without further ado, please welcome both of my guests to the show, Mama Erica Huggins and Sharif el Mecki. It's good to Hi. be here. It's Thank great you. to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Mama Hello. Erica in the house. This is fantastic. I mean, this is amazing. I know when we had our pre-show, I already told you, Mama, like this is a as always, like a fangirl moment for me and the opportunity to be talking to people who were like in the fight, in the struggle, and like really laid the pathway for us to continue it's on. It's still in it. Yes, definitely still in it. We love you and we appreciate you. Thank you very much. I love you too. And, and you too, Sharif. Yeah, and cool. to all the listeners, uh, thank you so much for being here. Yes. So mama, I want to jump right into it. Could you please share with us your journey to becoming a Black Panther and how that impacted your life? Well, I, I believe that each of us has a purpose on the planet. So I can't go all the way back to my birth, but I believe that I am here to serve. Mm -hmm. And when I was 15, and I attended the March on Washington in 1963. That belief that I'm here to serve was confirmed. And because I wanted to see change for Black and other people of color and anybody living in conditions of poverty, I made a vow to serve people for the rest of my life. And that shows up in different ways. There isn't one way to be an activist. Perhaps we can go back to this, Shana. Mm -hmm. um, we can't let other people define activism for us because mm -hmm. then we won't be. Mm -hmm. We don't think we can. Anyway, back to, back to my journey. So when I was 18, just about 18, actually, 
I read an article in a magazine that no longer exists. The magazine was called Ramparts. Hmm. It's hard to find, but in this issue, there was a feature article written by Eldridge Cleaver on the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. I was at Lincoln University, one of the historical Black universities in the United States, and one of the three that opened during American chattel slavery. Mm. And uh, I didn't know that then, but it was in 1967 when everything was moving. Everybody that could move had a movement and they were in it. There were all kinds of people uh, fostering organizations and coalitions for change. And so when I read this article, sitting in the student union building, I thought to myself, I can't wait for my friend John Huggins to come to the student union building. He was supposed to meet me. And what I was I was wordless after reading this article because what stood out to me in the article was that this was an organization to serve all poor and oppressed people. It wasn't just black focused or uh, poor focused or it didn't have that flavor of um, a wise people talking to less wise people. Mm -hmm. It was all about our collective uh, responsibility. And the word self-defense stood out to me as well. And it shifted my understanding of what defense is um, because it isn't just something physical. As a woman, I know this. As a woman, you know that, Shana. Yeah. Um, we defend ourselves with our words and our minds and our hearts and mm -hmm. our action, our action. So the Black Panther Party started in earnest in response to police brutality. And we still, we still, we humans are still working with that conundrum Yep. in 2021. But in 1967, I knew that there was a way I could serve and that this would be the next chapter in my journey. So without any words, when John did show up in the student union building, I handed him the Ramparts magazine, which by the way, had been read by so many brothers and sisters on that campus that the front cover was worn off <laughs> and the pages were, you know, you know how it gets dog-eared yeah. as they say? Yeah, got them passed it around. Everybody had passed it around. <laughs> passed it around. I was so grateful it came to me and that I could pass it on to John. We agreed that day that we would get in his little hoopty car and drive across the country. We were leaving school. Now, young people listening to me, I am not suggesting you leave school. <laughs> this was a different time. Mm -hmm. Human beings were the same, but this was a different time. We're in a different world. We're in a different place in our understanding of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. However, I knew I what didn't belong any longer on that campus. And John had come there straight from the Navy when he realized I need to go home and go back to school. I can't be on a ship mm. when the whole world is turning. I need to be in service to my people. So we were very connected that way. And so we did, we drove across the country in that article in Ramparts um, the Huey P. Newton Defense Committee was mentioned, and we we arrived in California because we were going to go there and help free Huey and join the party. We didn't go directly to Oakland. We ended up in Los Angeles because that's how far our gas money took us. When, <laughs> uh, I was 18 and he was 21. And... Um, and we arrived just in time to go to the unbelievably powerful Free Huey rally in Los Angeles. And the day before or the day after, I can't remember which happened first, there was one in Oakland at the Coliseum. They were identical rallies. 
what stood out to me about this rally and gelled for me that I'd made the right decision to drive across the country and join an organization that I knew was not going to be a, I knew it was the Black Panther Party, but I, partying was over. I knew it. I didn't know what my life would hold or whether I would even have it in the way that I knew it. But I knew that I had to do it. I was called. Mm. And so one of the things that struck me on that day at that rally is that Huey's mother stood at the microphone. She was introduced as Huey P. Newton's mother. There was like the whole place was clapping and cheering and there were tears. And she said a few words and then all she said, she said, I, I only have one other thing to do. I only have one other thing to say. And that is free my baby. Mm. And I wasn't a mother yet, but I understood that my mother would have said the same thing. Mm. Her mother had probably said the same thing mm -hmm. and on and on back and that it was time for us to interrupt so that mothers don't have to make that plea. So we're all interrupters, right? Yep. All of us, those, the three of us and everyone listening. Um, but I knew that my life would open in ways that were going to be beneficial and unpleasant. Mm. And you were ready to take that on. Yes, I, I, it was, it was, I was called, that's what I told my mother when I called my mother, who was still, I grew up in DC and I called my mother to tell her I was leaving. Mama, that was my next question. Like, so you just up and left with this man, what your mother said? <laughs> that was she was, she was my go to, you know, my father, I didn't talk to him that often uh, mm -hmm. about what was deep in my heart, but I, from ch early childhood, I could talk to my mother. Good. I asked my mother so many questions. It, it was unbelievable. But why is it like this? Mm -hmm. How, how's the moon shine every night? How's it know to do that? How's the sun stay in the sky? <laughs> Mama, that why was me. That? I was like that. Yes. Why are white people so mean? Mm -hmm. What did black people do? Mm -hmm. What do you mean slavery? Do you mean chores? Like mm -hmm. you have us do on Saturday? And she said no, and she explained slavery to me to the best of her ability. She was not a scholar of anything, and I'm so glad she wasn't. Mm. She spoke in very clear language, but she wasn't trying to convince me of anything. She was just telling me facts. Mm -hmm. This has stayed with me as an educator. Mm. And she grew up in rural North Carolina, where the Klan posted advertisements on billboards, mm. where she wasn't supposed to look a white person in the eye. Mm. She was one of 11 children on a farm. So I had to call her. There was no choice. John was with his family when we left the East Coast. I mean, we were all, we, we went from Philly to New York, to John's sister, to his youngest sister's wedding. And I called my mother and I said, I'm leaving. I'm going to join the Black Panther Party. And she had heard about it in the news, but she didn't know much about it. But she didn't ask me about it because she knew that if she opened her mouth, it wasn't going to be something I wanted to hear. Yeah. Because I was leaving school and I know she put her pennies together to send me the first in a long line of never been to college. Mm -hmm. And I apologized to her and she said, so, well, sugar, you always were the one, you're really quiet, but you always did what you wanted. <laughs> the mighty storm, the quiet storm. Well, I said, I'm not doing what I want. I said, mama, do you know how in the at Capitol View Baptist Church was, was a church she, um, requested that we go to every Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, she said, um, 
Yeah, well, I remember Capital View, what he's trying to say. I said, do you remember those people who said they were called to the church? Mm. And she got quiet. She said, yes, I do. I said, well, that's how I feel. But mm -hmm. it's not church. It's people. People need to be loved and they need to be respected and they need to be treated well. And I want to be a part of that. Mama, that's a beautiful story. I mean, and it's a beautiful calling and, and mission to, to be called to do. Um, and I think we hear so many of, you know, the stories of how people got involved in movements, but each one of you tell a story. Basically, you were called to do this. Um, I think we all are if we really admit the truth to ourselves. Mm -hmm. That there's something deep inside that we're, you know, we live in a society that is very um, skewed because of its um, very male and very European um, beginnings. Mm -hmm. And so something teaches men and boys, for instance, that it's not okay to feel. That's not humane. That's unfair. I have two sons and two grandsons. That's so unfair to human, little human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and we also sell, tell girls and who grow into, into women who believe that you can't do as much as men. You won't do it as well. You're not as intelligent. You're not as strong. It's not as insidious as it used to be, but it's still there. Because yes. structures have not changed. Systems have not changed. Mm -hmm. It's no one person's fault at all. Yes. However, um, you know, I just knew that I would be joining people who felt that way. I already knew John felt that way. And half of the Lincoln University campus felt that way. Um, and people, young people all over the world were moving. As I said, they were Latinx. They were, they were indigenous. They were anti-war radicals they were white women they were women of color there were there was the gay liberation movement i told you everything that could move was moving and mm. they were asian american and pacific islander and and i i knew that there were people who were serious you know and, and great too. You make a really great point. I think that a lot of times because it was called the Black Panther Party and we were about Black power, I think the the most significant thing was power to the people um, and the unity and the coalition that were built through the Black Panther Party. Those stories don't get told. Those stories don't get, um, you know, publicized. Well, maybe, maybe Shayna and Sharif in your capacities, maybe you can tell them. Hey, that's why we're here. <laughs> no, I, I mean, on an ongoing basis with other people. Yes. Because um, there's, there, there is a, a, a film that everybody should see called The First Rainbow Coalition. I don't know if you've seen it, mm -mm. but whoa, it is the story of the Rainbow Coalition that Fred Hampton created in Chicago and in the, in the, Appala in the white Appalachian communities and in the uh, Puerto Rican and other Latinx communities in Chicago. It was all about black, brown, and white people working together. That mm -hmm. was Fred Hampton's wave. It gets attributed to- It get hijacked, it get hijacked, right? Yeah, it gets attributed to other people, but the Rainbow Coalition was Fred Hampton. He, what an incredible human being he was. Mm -hmm. He is. And it's how he was. So anyway, they, um, um, so that was the first, one of the first um, waves of coalition. But women also did that in recognizing that the, the women's movement as it was in the 60s didn't welcome women of color. Mm -hmm. So for instance, right. the third World Women's Alliance was created. People don't know about the Third World Women's Alliance. They were amazing. They were started by Black women. And then by the time I did work with them to fight infant mortality, they were primarily Asian American women. Mm. Um, 
it it didn't matter who who we who we worked with as long as they had understanding that if if what we need to do is for people of color then people of color need to be in the lead that's right if what we're wanting to do for women then women need to be in the lead if it's for um to fight a, a apartheid in south africa then everybody can do it but yeah. the south africans are the, the, the experts at what right. is going on that's right so um and that took some doing so there were there were rocky starts um but we talked to each other um well at least i know the women did <laughs> sometimes yeah. there were struggles but i think coalition building is very important today and it's not as difficult as we might think. We didn't have any cell phones. <laughs> we didn't have any internet. So that makes us wonder, right? Mama, we had these conversations. And Shreve, I would love for you to chime in on this, right? Because you, your coalition built now. You're in the world of technology, age of technology, and phones and things like that. But Mama back in the how you talking about you just left Lincoln. You just left, you just drove. I'm, and my mom like, well, who did she call? Did they write people letters to say they was coming? You, you had that quarters say? back then, right? You had to go to that phone booth. You know what I mean? Close, <laughs> close the booth, come out like superwoman. You know what I mean? Like, yes. hey, this is what we doing. That's you know? Right. And back then, that's what everybody trying to get in that line to get on that phone that's hanging on the wall or in the booth. And mm -hmm. to to your point, Sharif. So I my favorite the the most fun thing I can think of doing is to talk to elementary school children whose teachers are uh, so great at telling the truth in their classrooms that are writing curriculums for their elementary school children about black liberation movements about coalition building, about the Black Panther Party. So the favorite, my favorite thing is to talk to fourth and fifth graders, because this is before they're told, absolutely forced to think in a certain way. Mm -hmm. By the way, the Oakland Community Schools principle was, we teach, we hope to teach children how, not what to think. Mm -hmm. We didn't even know that term, critical thinking. Right. I'm glad we didn't because we probably would have laughed. Um, <laughs> can you imagine? We would say things like, can you imagine using that kind of language with a second grader? That's not going <laughs> to go over. So anyway, this one little girl, I'm telling her about pay phone, Cherie, and she said, excuse me, Erica. And I go, yeah, what's a pay phone? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, they have no idea, no clue. So, like, as I'm thinking about how movements and coalitions were built and how that was built during times where we not nearly as, as much technology or even thinking about social media right now. and We didn't have you know, nothing. We had word of mouth. We got the first mayor of Oakland, California elected with feet and words. We stomped, mm -hmm. we knocked on doors, we talk to people. We went out on street corners. We went to community gatherings, recreation centers. We went anywhere that people wanted us to be. And mm -hmm. the first black mayor was elected because we got the vote out. We didn't mind sitting out somewhere in, in the rain or the cold or whatever it took. And it was the same way in all the chapters around the country. And that, um, that, 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 just that blood, sweat, tears, and like digging in. Yeah. And Sharif, I would human connection. Yeah. Um, just you know, Mama Erica was a leader in the movement, and your parents, uh, as most of the audience knows, uh, were, were Black Panthers. When did you first recognize, or like, what's your earliest mem memory of like recognizing, like, oh snap, like I'm in this movement, right? <laughs> like, I I'm yeah. with my parents, like, I'm a cub, like, we're doing <laughs> this. <laughs> you know what? Um, I don't remember when I didn't know. So my earliest recollections was about, you know, like, you know, what does justice look like? What does, you know, and, and to uh, Mama Erica's point, 
right? Like how you speak to the youth, right? And I think, you know, at the center, we're talking about, we work with first, second, and third graders and the high school students and the college students, right? She's talking about fourth and fifth, right? That elementary school. And so I think for me, being both at home in this ecosystem of, you know, revolutionary spirits in action, and then being able to attend the school that's very, so I can't wait till Mama uh, Erica talks a little bit more about the, you know, the liberation uh, schools, because our, our school, Nathamo Sasa, was also you know, built with that kind of activism in mind. And it was only, it was a pre-K to sixth grade school. So they were constantly speaking about, you know, what does it mean um, to be, you know, to be uh, part of the resistance, even as children, and how to defend in all different kind of ways. You know, I think I shared with you before, you know, our political science and martial arts teacher, Baba Chang, used to say, you want to speak the truth, you got to be able to defend the truth. And he didn't mean going around punching all the time, but he meant like the intellectual rigor and the understanding and the depth of knowledge and research, being able to speak all of those things. But, you know, I, I can tell you, like one of my earliest memories was my mother talking about police brutality and Rizzo, uh, my father being one of the, uh, you know, the black men accosted and, and during the raid in, uh, what was it, 1970, 71, uh, when Frank Rizzo raided uh, and his henchmen raided police, uh, I mean, the Panther Party um, had them outside handcuffed in, in their boxers and afros, right? And so those are early memories that I that I recall. And I remember the conversation about this stuff even before my mother showed me the picture. You know, I remember being seven years old and and watching Delbert Africa being you know kicked in the face and dragged down the street by, by his locks. You know, and at the kitchen table. You know, um, on the six o'clock news, you know, and so all of those things were part of it. And then being able to go to a elementary school that had political science as a class for elementary school kids, you know, and martial arts, Vita Sa'ana as our health and PE course, not like, oh, you're not taking gym, you're taking African martial arts as your physical education um, course and with the political science and history, which we didn't call black history, we called it history, but it was all about, you know, um, the, the contributions and the connections of, of black people. So um, I think all of that, that ecosystem, I don't remember, my earliest recollection was being like, oh, I'm a child of the struggle, I'm connected with other children of the struggle, and we're connected to these uh, activists who, you know what, love us, you know, like ultimately they're doing all this work because of their deep, profound, sustained love for us and our community which was just unwavering, man. That's what that, I mean, that's what I remember the most, like being always felt being loved, you know, by the, my teachers, by the circle, by learning how to read on, on a indoor porch by, you know, in Dr. Schultz's house, you know? Uh, so the Panthers were like, it was just all over. Like, Hey, this is how you learn how to read. You're four years old, but this is important. Right. And so I think all of those experiences, I don't remember what happened before that. I was probably just sucking on a bottle or so. Yeah. You know I, mean? so. I mean, in every, every single revolutionary activist and folks that I talk to in the movement and the struggle, they all talk about this, this undying, undying love that they felt. Number one, to serve the people, um, but then the people who were served by them, the love that they felt from those activists. And I feel like that's super important because a lot of times we paint these movements i mean it's a lot of struggle it's a lot of strife like uh folks are fighting for freedom um they paint it as like drifted out of anger and people are really doing this work out of love yeah love i mean there's there's outrage and broken heartedness about how your people that you love are being treated right so there is rage there is outrage you mm -hmm. know is you know like we're just like oh no like this is absolutely unacceptable but it's because of the love that's you know that's generated i, re I remember you know, hearing the stories of when my father and others were underground, you know, and the police were putting posters of their pictures up in the community. Guess what was happening? Community members were taking them down. They weren't even part of the party. You know, they were just like taking them down. Like, nah, that's our brother. They help us. They support us. They're protecting us. They're defending us. And so, you know, all those things were just little examples that, you know, just you know, throughout my, my memories. But yeah, love. So, that's, so it's, it starts and ends with that. Yes. And Mama Sharif points to one of his earliest memories, basically being in Nuthamo Sasa. He always talks about Nuthamo Sasa to us. Um, and that's the Black Liberation School that he went to. Well, Mama, you led a Black Liberation School. Yeah? Yes. Can you talk to us about that experience or even the, the notion of like, you know what? I'm going to start a school <laughs> and I'm going to lead this. Um, I didn't start it. The Black Panther Party started this concept of educating children 
separate from the traditional education paradigm, mm. which warehouse children. It's not the fault of teachers. There are some really great teachers in public schools everywhere and always have been. I mm. had some of them. I can still remember my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Roy, just saying her name calls her face and her loving way and her soft voice and her care for each little being in her classroom. That was kindergarten. I've never forgotten her. Never. I won't intentionally forget her. Um, and so the way it all began, it's kind of a trajectory, an incarnation of different school ideas. Quickly, um, the children of the Black Panther Party were, I'm sorry to say, treated poorly by teachers who were fearful. Mm. I could use the term hate, but I love what Mahatma Gandhi says about hate. He says, what we think is hate is really fear mm. itself. And if we think about racism, isn't that what it is? Yes. And then it leads to hateful action. Well, thinking, saying, and doing. Yep. At any rate, so um, one of the, the chief of staff of the Black Panther Party at the time, this was in the um, maybe 68, 69, David Hilliard said, well, we'll keep the children home. We'll educate them. We were not thinking homeschooling. There was no conversation about homeschooling, mm. but we knew that people did it. So the children stayed home and we educated them. All right. And then the community heard about that. And we want our children to be, have part of that. Anything the Black Panther Party is doing, we want our children. Yes. Oh, yes. And um, so things began to expand. So we needed to be not just in a little house that somebody had somewhere in Oakland, but in a bigger space. And so we found this gigantic space in the Fruitvale area of Oakland, which is like the mission in San Francisco. And I don't know what the Latinx portions of big cities are. I can't name them all, but you understand that's where we found this house. Mm. And um, we started with about 25 children and it had a dormitory too, because party members worked 19 hours a day. Our children couldn't, we didn't expect our children to keep up with us. Mm. And that also has its, uh, its, its wonderfulness and its challenges mm -hmm. that we, we weren't with our children in the way we wanted to be the women particularly mm. because women are expected to raise the children looking yes. at that old paradigm that old structure those old systems mm -hmm. and beliefs so that house and we every we lived collectively pretty much party members because we couldn't afford to pay rent so we pooled whatever money coming into the party to go to rent. Mm -hmm. um, um, so we lived in groups of sometimes five or six or more. But mm -hmm. the children's house had a dormitory so the children could all, who needed to stay overnight, could all stay. And also sometimes there were children who stayed there who uh, were the sons and daughters of community members who couldn't care for their children. Mm -hmm. for all kinds of reasons. They were newly incarcerated. They were addicted. Whatever life was giving us. Mm -hmm. All of these things that challenge us come out of the history of African peoples in the United States, mm -hmm. just like all of the things besetting the indigenous people of the United States come out of that history of the stolen land and culture mm -hmm. and the brutality. So we, we want to forget that it is history. Yep, it's a part of who we are. And if we're all connected right now, wouldn't we also be connected to not just our ancestors, but the, the flow of history? Yes. Which is connecting us to our future. We have some choices for our future that I say quite happily if human beings put all of this into place, then human beings can change it. So 
in that big house in the Fruitvale area, we had classes and a dormitory. And then one of the grandmothers of a party member, um, of, of a party member's child said to Huey, we need to have a dedicated school site. We can't keep moving the children everywhere. Let's, let's have a dedicated school building. The big house that I described to you in the Fruitvale area of Oakland, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally telling you where in Oakland so you understand that it was in the heart of community. Mm-hmm. When that grandmother said that, we were already getting that same thing from the community. We want our children to go there. How could... How can our children be part of the school? We don't want them to go where they're not wanted and where they're not getting quality education. Again, this isn't the fault of teachers. Um, And so that building was called the Samuel Napier Intercommunal Youth Institute. Mm. And Huey said, Many times, one time I heard him say it. We got to change the name of that school. The people aren't going to know what an intercommunal youth institute is. <laughs> and that's right. He said, we'll call it Oakland Community School. Because that's what it is. It's mm-hmm. a school in the community. And it moved into East Oakland, which is, which then was almost all black and brown. Mm. And um, we opened the doors in 1973, 74 school year with 50 children and the grapevine. Within a month, we had 90 children and then we met our capacity of 150 children. It was an old church building that we, with the help of people who could get loans because black people couldn't get loans from the bank. And definitely the Black Panther Party going in for a loan. (laughs) It wasn't going to happen. (laughs) So, so, and a corporation was, a nonprofit corporation was formed and the house was bought in in the name of that corporation. And um, it was our building, our school building from that school year until the school year 1981-82. And Huey asked me to be the director. I was working on the party newspaper because I've always liked to write and I've always liked to read. And he said, would you be the the director? And I said, yes, the director before me at the Youth Institute had to move back to her hometown. And um, so I did. Our motto was... And I sometimes I say is because I feel the school still exists in those young people who are now in their 50s, mm-hmm. people like me and the teachers who are still alive and the parents and the grandparents mm-hmm. and the community. They never forgot it. And if you carry on. What? Yeah. No, I was just saying the legacy carries on. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just yes, it out loud. Yeah. I, I just didn't hear you. It does carry on and and remind me, Shana, to tell you a story about the school building and the people in it now, okay? Mm Because we're not there. But at any rate, um, so we, when we, during that time, we had 150 children. We had a waiting list with unborn children on it. (laughs) Why? Because we said the world, our motto, The world is a child's classroom. Mm -hmm. We didn't say the black community is a child's classroom. The world. Because we knew that there was a way in which people living in the United States and other parts of North America were not global, globally educated. And we wanted our children to understand not only what was going on in South Africa and in Vietnam but and inside the prisons and jails, but also what's going on in South America, in all the parts of Central and Latin America, in to look at Africa from a 
broad perspective um, to think about the people who live in Europe who are of African descent and mm -hmm. South American descent and Asian descent, that there's a world beyond the one we've been trained to believe exists. And um, so I'll pause there. We were tuition, I want to say this though, we were tuition free. Mm. <laughs> you like, I just want to put that. We ain't yeah. charge no money. <laughs> no, because people didn't have any money. Yes. With, these children came from families in the housing projects, which is in the projects, uh, as we said, and mm -hmm. uh, and some living in other conditions of poverty uh, with single moms running the home. And, and they came from all over Oakland, from deep East Oakland to West Oakland. And that may not mean anything to people who don't understand Oakland, but okay. you got a deep East Oakland in your city if you're listening. And, <laughs> um, and San Francisco, Hayward, Berkeley, all the nearby cities drew the children. We had transportation to get them there in the morning if their parents couldn't afford bus fare and they, or they couldn't walk. And uh, we served three meals a day. And here's the one that I most love. We were parent friendly. We were scared of parents. Y'all were all the things that a school should be. <laughs> and, how did, and how did we know to do it? We were so young. And not and the, we we didn't we didn't have degrees. I mean, I went to school to be, become an educator, but I didn't finish until years and years later. Because How you do don't you need know? a degree to understand humanity, Thank and I you. think that that is that is what the Black Panther Party did well. Um, your comrades and the people who were in that movement. You do not need a degree to understand humanity. You do not need a degree to talk to people and to understand the needs of people and then to service the people. And I think that that is what is so important and sticks out in all the information that you shared. And you yeah. are a true servant leader. And I don't yeah. think people understand what servant leadership really is. You are serving the needs of the people, of the community. And you don't need a degree to do that. No, they asked us to. And that's the other thing about our 64 community survival programs, of which the Oakland Community School was one of the longest lasting ones and one of the biggest and well known, like the free breakfast for children's program or the people's free medical clinics. But people don't know about the busing to prisons programs. And they may or may not know about what the clinics did to um, provide education and testing for sickle cell anemia. Um, and they may not also know that by 1969, members, um, women were 66% of the membership of the Black Panther Party. Yes, mom, you so, segue right into the next. Um, yes, you we, know, we, don't have no, we can squeezed on time, but I would love um, to hear you talk about the impact on women in the party. Um, Sharif always speaks very highly of women um, in the Black Panther movement, of course, because he lifts up his mom um, and rest in power to uh, Mama Aisha. But he speaks so highly of women and their impact um, on him. Um, if you look at his work, anybody who knows Sharif, he surrounds himself with women. <laughs> That's, good. That's healthy. That's healthy. Um, and <laughs> And I'm surrounded by young men, my two sons and my grandsons. And there is a way that um, we miss out if we don't seek the truth about one another. Mm -hmm. We think we know, but a lot of what we've been told to think is not, is not in alignment with reality. And um, the women that came to the Black Panther Party, and I've been talking to so many of them because we're um, many of uh, many people uh, know the names of certain women of the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. But do they know Sharif's mother's name? Can you say her name, Sharif? 
Sure. Um, Aisha Mackey back then she was a uh, Sandra Dickerson. Um, you know, during their part and and yeah, thanks for my you know I was fortunate not only my parents met and married in a party but also uh, my father had two cousins, uh, two maternal cousins. One of them being Russell Schultz, the other one being Saida Schultz, who also um, passed away. But you know, just hearing the stories about whether it was Paula Peoples or you know Barbara Cox or Seal or Tony or Sister Love and Dolores Martin, like all of these women, uh, black women who were just pouring into communities, um, you know. And then you know uh, we had Mama Fasaha, one of one of the founders, uh, you know, of Nathamusasa School, which very similarly started in somebody's house, right? Like, oh, we're going to give our children alternative uh, educational experience, and then grew to another um, to another building. But I think these, uh, and as you said, so many of the the men were much like today, mass incarceration was evidence back then, uh, police brutality, murder. And so there were so many men who were snatched out of homes and streets, whether permanently or indefinitely, you know, or even temporarily. And, and the sisters were stepping up and doing multiple, uh, multiple things, right? Um, immense sacrifice uh, for the community, um, you know, and for the children of the community, basically for our collective future. Yes, and and uh, thank you, Sharif. And um, maybe you and I can talk at another point about your mother, with the project that I'm working on. Um, Don't just so, graze over that project, Mama. Tell the people what the project is. <laughs> I will. I will. I just want it you to know that, Sharif. I really do want to talk to you about your mother. No, appreciate that. They were uh, Barbara Cox said they were actually doing a mural in San Francisco for some of the uh, Oakland. women in Oakland. Oh. Okay, in Oakland. My mother is, is part of that. Okay, right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it once it's, uh, once it's, it's done. done. Oh, it's, oh, I have to come check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's in West Oakland where the party, one of the party's first national headquarters was. Okay. It's not far from there. And you'll love this. It, the mural is at a house, a huge house that has a street facing wall that's 70 feet tall. Mm. And the woman, Jill Christina Best, who had the idea for the mural, called me one day and she said, you, in 2020, and she said, you know what, Erica, they're tearing down monuments, but what are we going to put up? Mm. Yeah. And I Don't said, just burn Bill. <laughs> well, good point. And she, and I said, she said, so what do you think about me doing a mural that is an homage to the women of the Black Panther Party? I, I said, that. It's about time. <laughs> it's about time. And we collected over 200, I think about 300 names. And Sharif, all the names that we could find, and if your mother isn't there, I will get her name added. But the muralist took a photo of Stephen Shames. And I'll get to the project, Shana, uh, in a minute, because Stephen had the idea for the project. He's a photojournalist who was this young white radical who became friends with Bobby Seale. And Bobby said, take photos of us. We need it. <laughs> Bobby knew that somebody needed to document something because we were too busy to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, and Stephen's photos are incredible. And he captures us in action. And uh, so we, the Face, the biggest part of the mural is um, women in action on that wall, but also hand painted. Yes, that's that's the book before, but this one is going to be different. It's going to be different. At any rate, the mural, um, all the women's names are hand painted on the wall. Women walk up to that wall, Shana, having never been thanked, acknowledged, appreciated for anything they've ever done, mm -hmm. and they burst into tears or they burst into laughter. That's me. <laughs> so to make a long story short, because I know you don't have forever on, on your podcast, um, Steve Shames called me one day to say, I think we should do the next photo journal book should be focused on women. And again, I said, it's about time. 
and we created the way it will look um, and that it will have the actual voices of, of women like Barbara Cox and Hazel Mack and Asali Dixon. It will have the artwork, back page covers of the party newspaper done by Madeline Gale Asali Dixon, who people don't know. They don't know that she was an artist and she was mentored by my dear friend, Emery Douglas. We will have poetry. We will have, most importantly though, the women's words about why they joined the Black Panther Party and what their memorable moments were. It is one, it is a labor of love and it is the most amazing, amazing, I don't even want to call it a project anymore, but it's called Comrade Sisters, mm -hmm. Women of the Black Panther Party. And we hope that it will be published in the by the early summer 2022, which is soon. And we're using photographs, um, Steve's photographs and a few others. And so we want women of all ages and little girls to look at this book and say, she looked like me. Did she do that? I could do that. And um, it really, really is um, a way of uplifting women and Sharif. We are talking with the sons and daughters of women, or we have. We're done talking to people, but I've got to talk to you. Um, we are talking to the sons and daughters of women who have passed on. Amazing. Yeah, that sounds so powerful. Just so powerful. And, you know, yeah, for young ladies and, and little boys, but to look at these women and say they did all of that. They look like me, like, oh, like, and understanding the power within the ancestor, the black blueprint that exists um, yes. and tapping into it. So it's all of all of it is a call to action. Even this this photo, um, Comrade Sisters, it's, it's a call to action, right? The same way that the, the Panthers did, the same thing that you heard when you left yes. Lincoln. And it also connects then and now uh -huh. because yeah. there are there are Comrade Sisters in. Uh -huh. Black Lives Matter, another organization. It that it that term is is seems to be located in a particular part of history. But if you think about it, if you are a friend in struggle, mm -hmm. that is a particular bond. That's a particular. Mm -hmm. bond. Yeah, I was. That's the same thing. I was thinking like the the phrase, uh, comrade sisters. Um, that's a deep. That's a deep phrase. It is a deep phrase. Um, it's a very deep phrase. Like it just again, it speaks to the love, but it speaks to the fight, the solidarity, the unity, the humanity. I like. I love that phrase that you guys uh, are using for that. And it's it also it one of the things that I love so much about this particular book is that the women talk about taking care of each other. There's not enough of that. The importance and it doesn't of take much. No, it doesn't take much. It, it doesn't take any money. No, it doesn't. And no. it doesn't take a lot of time. And again, the paradigm for struggle was um, first presented to the Black Panther Party as you know, the movements around the world, it was a very male premise. Mm -hmm. It just was, there's no, I don't have any judgment about it. It's, it was a male premise. And the taking care of is the one thing we didn't know how to do in the party. Mm -hmm. We were not, we were, not, we did it, but sometimes we didn't take care of ourselves. We served the people, but we forgot we were a part of the people. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? We do. So this we is a value book. we call sustaining the soul. So That's we, right. That's yeah. right. And so we hope this book and all the great things that will pour out of doing this book will, because um, it's really more than a book. It's, um, it's the beginning of possibility for caring for and uplifting one another because young activists today are asking me and, and my friends and sisters 
How'd you do it? Mm -hmm. What'd you do when you wake up in the middle of the night crying and you don't even know what you're crying about? Mm -hmm. What do you do with all that heartbreak? One death after the other. What do you do about um, trust? How do you keep on loving? And so we're hoping this book will, will be an uplift and will make people smile and give them hope uh, for, the, for their future work and for the work of that future children will do. Oh, I so, think it will. Uh, so thank you for asking me about that. I think it definitely was beautiful. Um, one Absolutely. last point I would love to hint on um, because it's pivotal to our work and it's, it's pivotal to sustaining the movement. One thing that I think that happened uh, with the Panther Party that was pivotal was like it, it was young people who led that movement. You left from college. <laughs> you were 18 and drove to Oakland <laughs> To like be in this movement and like had a lifelong dedication to it. Um, how do we in current times, do you think, attract young people um, into service work, into servant leadership work? And what do you think like made it so attractive to the a, a, to the party? Like why were young people so attracted to the party? Why were young people so attra attracted to Black Lives Matter? Mm. Why were young people attracted to the civil rights movement? Who were the freedom riders mm -hmm. who went into the deep and fear-based South and some of whom gave their lives? Mm -hmm. Why? Love, just like Sharif said, it was love. It is love. It's always love. If we just move beyond what with the hateful things we think we're seeing to, oh, Here's what I can do. I can feed people. Do you know there's an organization in Oakland called the People's Kitchen Collective? All their principles come from the Black Panther Party's free food programs, not just the breakfast program, but the food giveaways. Did you know that Bobby Seale ran for mayor to point out how mu much power the vote has? And during this time, we gave out 10,000 bags of groceries. Who does that? Mm -hmm. And when Bobby said, put a chicken in every bag, how did we do it? We did. But we didn't overthink it. We didn't have spreadsheets and all. We just got it done. Yes, Mama, speak that. Okay. And, um, and we didn't have meetings about the meetings to have a meeting. Chill. We <laughs> we we just Did somebody said, say amen. Yes. We just said the children don't have any breakfast before school and this they can't no. And so mostly women and a lot of men got up at 4 30 in the morning in whatever city they were in and got in somebody's hoopty car or some little van or something and drove to the local place where and cooked the food and gave it to, was it woman's work? No, it was not. It was community service. Human beings. Um, absolutely. And so I want to encourage people today um, to do what a man in that beautiful um, film, First Raid Mo Coalition says, if you're looking for something to do, go open your front door and stand there. There's something right in front of you. There's something to the left of you. There's something to the right of you. And there's something behind you. Step up and do it. I love that. That's how all those 64 community survival programs got started. People told us what they needed. We had the school in Oakland. And I remember somebody said to some people in New York, do you want a school? No, we want. A free clothing and and coat and boot program for the cold ass winters in New York. Mm -hmm. We understood it. So clothing programs in the Midwest and the East Coast. And we have documentation by photo of a lot of this, but not enough. Mm -hmm. But when people sell said, um, 
You know, I want to learn to read. We didn't ignore them because it wasn't in our idea of activism. We ran adult literacy programs in the building that was the Oakland Community School because what was that building doing at night and on the weekends? Nothing. So we had all kinds of pro seniors program, a teen program, adult literacy, all kinds of things. And we did not send other parts of our community away. We never turned a child away or family. So we have Latino families in the school and white families in the school. We were all from um, the same conditions. Um, so I, I think that we get used to silo formation and I just wanna um, encourage collaboration and coalition building. Mama, I love you. Can I say that? Um, oh, yes, you can. I love you too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I love you very much. I really do. Um, we are winding down on time. Of course, the people in the chat are like, we need longer. And that's <laughs> all we always want a part two. So, Mama, I know your schedule is busy, but we have to definitely have you back on somewhere in the, the near future. This was amazing, and it, like, fed my soul. And I just want to say that thank you so much for all of the work that you have done. Um, and I know that you're recognized heavily for the work you've done in the Black Panther Party, but you are a true hum humanitarian. Um, and you've done, I'm pretty sure, so much work on so many levels with so many people in so many communities. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I wanted to tell you that story. Do you have one, two minutes? No. Um, E class, can, can we have two minutes? I don't want to cut <laughs> Sister Erica off. I think we at 104. I think if you got two minutes, I think we'll go for two more minutes before the broadcast. Oakland Community oh, School. Absolutely. Oakland yeah. Community School, the building we bought. We closed the school in 1982, but the and the building still stood, of course. Mm -hmm. And an organization called the Men of Valor. It's a reentry program four incarcerated men opened their doors about a decade later. It's run by clergy, the actual day-to-day -day running. And um, so I went to visit to take somebody interested in Oakland Community School in to see the building, this very special building. And the pastor who's running kind of the director said to me, do you, I want to tell you one thing. Do you know every now and again, a man will come through men of valor and they'll say, this used to be my school. That was the best part of my life. The best part. Everybody loved me. So I said, my life didn't turn out so good, but I'll never forget it. And he, these are men that don't know each other that, over time end up in this reentry program in that building. So I'm saying legacy. We don't need to know how we're impacting people. We we can operate from the belief that we are. So glad you shared that. Yeah. Yeah, Mama, that was again, this is this has been a very grounding <laughs> conversation. Yeah. That's how I describe Nathan Masasa all the time, right? Like I just yes. like it was the the best time, and not just me, my classmates. Like we we say, like that is such a source, and and if we can continue to uh, bring in activists uh, who look at children and 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 their learning and teaching as a form of activism, and then what that can continue to do, you know, um, as we continue to develop young black youth um, to become. Uh, dope, amazing black educators uh, so that they can understand yeah. this is the impact. This is the impact. Yeah. And, um, you know, and also just have to give a shout out to, you know, um, uh, Mama Bell Hooks, who, who uh, joined the ancestors and yeah, just the right. way that she talked about teaching and education and, you know, that it was a way to transgress against anti-blackness, against anti-humanity, against anti, um, you know, whatever. And one of the things she said, and like, it's a movement beyond boundaries. Love. And yes, for, exactly. For love. For love. And yeah. So everybody out there, read anything Bell, Bell Hooks wrote. 
and teaching to transgress is a powerful start. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, Sharif. Thank you, Shana. Thank yes, you. Mama, I think you definitely just uh, the closing remarks, if you want to give any to the folks watching out there. You know, one time a group of teenagers asked me, what did I want? What did I want to close with? What do I want young people to know? And it is something I want all people to know. And I've kept it. I mean, I said it once and the young people were it really let it land for them. So I, I say it when everybody, whenever someone asks me that question, Shana. Love is a great expression of power. Use it to transform your world. Hmm. Mama, thank you. Well stuff. Yes. I want to thank everybody out there for joining us this week for this amazing show. I know my soul was fed. I hope you guys were too. Um, but as always, thank you for joining us every Thursday for the Black for Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast. We love you. We thank you. And we'll be, we won't be back um next week. We'll be on break, but we will be back the 30th with our resident Baba, Dr. Carr in the mix. But thank you to Mama Huggins. Thank you to Sheree. Thank you. Um, we will see everybody here again, same place, same time in two weeks. Peace, everybody. All power.